Natalia, your um, microphone is off, I think. Hello, welcome to the Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. I'm Natalia Shpilova Said, and let me introduce Ani Abramian, treasurer of the Ukrainian Studies Organization, and our speaker today, uh, Dr. Sarah Phillips. We are delighted to start today our series of talks and lectures. We will be holding lectures every Tuesday. Our guests are scholars from the US and abroad who will share their research pertaining to Ukraine and Ukrainian studies. Our lectures will also be available on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Uh, today, Dr. Sarah Phillips will open our series with her lecture, Moral Economies of Care and Women Who Use Drugs in Ukraine. Sarah Phillips is Professor of Anthropology at Indiana University and Director of the Russian and East European Institute. Her primar primary interests are in sociocultural and medical anthropology, especially gender and health, disability, addiction, and HIV and AIDS. She has conducted research in Ukraine since 1995, most recently on HIV uh, and prevention programs for people who use drugs, especially women. Dr. Phillips' early field work also took place in Ukraine 1995-1996, and it focused on the myriad effects of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. She argues that Chernobyl symbols serve as a set of resources. They produce memory, and they are the grounds for making a new society. Sarah Phillips has authored a number of articles. She has published book-length research, disability and mobile citizenship in post-socialist uh, Ukraine and women's social activism in the new Ukraine, development and the politics of differentiation. So we will start with uh, Dr. Phillips' lecture. Please submit your comments and questions via the Q&A option, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Sarah Phillips will address those during our Q&A session. You can also ask your questions directly. Just let us know and Ani will open that option for you. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you, Ani. It is uh, such an honor to be the uh, first speaker in this wonderful uh, Ukrainian Studies Organization lecture series for the fall, and I wish you best of luck with the series. I want to uh, share my screen and show some PowerPoint slides, so forgive me while I put that together really quickly. Okay, so I wanted to, uh, to note that uh, while I am the speaker today, the research that I'm describing is very much a uh, collective project. And uh, here you can see the members of our research team. The title of the talk is Moral Economies of Care and Women Who Use Drugs in Ukraine. But the broader project on which this talk is based uh, was a project called Exploring Gendered Access to Drug and HIV Services in Ukraine to Improve Programs for Women. And uh, these are the members of our research team. I'll note that the uh, instigator of the project and, and, and uh, principal investigator is Jill Ocharzak from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, everyone that you see listed here also played a major part in this research. Uh, Alona Majnaya, Olga Filipova, Tatiana Zub, and Polina Alpatova, all of whom I'm delighted to say, in, in, in addition to Jill Ocharzak, are on the call today. So it's wonderful to have all of you here. And um, it's been a pleasure working with you on this project. I'll also note that Amy Allen of the SUNY Downstate Medical Center uh, was a major author of the, the paper that I'm presenting with you today. Amy and I worked very closely on this paper together with input from uh, all of the other members of the team. So because the issue of drug use in Ukraine is closely tied to HIV, I wanted to spend some time here at the outset describing the epidemiology of HIV in Ukraine, especially for women who use drugs. 
And I'll note that Ukraine, along with the Russian Federation, continues to experience the largest HIV epi epidemic in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And the majority of HIV infection occurs among people who inject drugs and their sex partners. So to go a little deeper into the epidemiology of HIV in Ukraine, um, as I mentioned, uh, injecting drug use is a major vector of HIV infection in the country. And we did see a rapid increase in drug use in Ukraine after 1991. In 2018, approximately 1.4% of the adult population in Ukraine were injecting drug users, and that's approximately 350,000 people. Um, you might be wondering what kinds of drugs uh, people in Ukraine usually use when they inject drugs. We're not talking about heroin and we're not talking about fentanyl. We are, however, talking about um, opiates and these are mostly homemade opiates called shirka or a poppy straw. So it's, it's a homemade opiate that is made from poppy straw. Um, there is also some street methadone in the mix. And um, also um, along with opiates, people do use stimulants mostly, uh, which are made from, um, that they get from pharmacies. Um, but really the main uh, drug of choice is homemade opiates. So at the end of 2018, in Ukraine, there were 240,000 people living with HIV. 70% of people who were living with HIV knew their HIV status. 51% of people living with HIV, HIV were on antiretroviral treatment. Ukraine has done a very good job getting antiretroviral medicines to children and to pregnant women. Um, it's done a less uh, good job on getting ARV treatment um, to the rest of the population living with HIV. At the end of 2018, we had seen almost 16,000 new HIV cases in Ukraine. And during 2018, there were around 3,500 AIDS deaths. The prevalence rate or percentage of people living with HIV among adults in the country is right around 1%. And you can see here that um, HIV is really concentrated in several key populations. Um, the prevalence rate of HIV among people who inject drugs is 22, around 22.6%. Um, this does vary with region, and so research has shown that in some regions, HIV prevalence among injecting drug users is actually closer to 40%. Um, men who have sex with men in Ukraine have a 7.5% prevalence rate. Commercial sex workers have a 5.2% prevalence rate, and people in prison have a prevalence rate of 3.3%. So this is just a general overview of, or a snapshot of the epidemiology of HIV in Ukraine today. If we look at the HIV epidemic globally and in Ukraine, uh, we can see that there are differences between men's and women's risk for HIV, particularly among people who use drugs. Worldwide, women who use drugs face unique sexual and drug-related HIV risks. And these stem from structural violence and the subordinate position of women in society and in personal relationships. Among other factors, women's elevated HIV risk from sex stems from a diminished ability to engage in safe sexual behaviors due to power inequalities and other relationship dynamics. Drug use um, exacerbates the risk for women of HIV. Women worldwide are more likely than men to have a steady sexual partner who injected drugs. They're more likely to report unprotected sex with these partners and they're more likely to exchange sex for money or drugs. 
Um, added to this is the fact that women who use drugs often face marginalization, stigma, and isolation within their communities, which can affect the conditions in which sexual and drug use behaviors occur. Women may try to hide their drug habit to avoid negative reactions associated with breaching stereotyped gender roles. They may fear that their children will be removed from their custody if authorities learn of their drug use. And these fears may prevent women from seeking harm reduction and drug treatment services, as well as many other medical and social services. And if we uh, turn to look specifically at gender and HIV in Ukraine, studies in Ukraine have shown that women who use drugs are more likely than male drug users to be HIV positive and to engage in risky injecting behavior and also to engage in high risk sexual behavior. They're also more likely than men to exchange sex for drugs. And while women account for up to 40% of all new cases of HIV infection in Ukraine, unfortunately, they are consistently underrepresented in research studies among drug users. Um, most research in the re region is conducted without a specifically gendered lens, or if it does have a gendered lens, it tends to only focus on HIV risk for women through commercial sex work. And so this gap is one reason that we decided to focus our study on issues of HIV vulnerability in Ukraine from a specifically gendered lens. So the title of um, the project, again, is Exploring Gendered Access to Drug and HIV Services in Ukraine to Improve Programs for Women. And um, we wanted to understand women's experiences accessing and receiving a variety of services. And by, by women here, I mean women who use drugs. Um, the services that we were interested in were medical services, harm reduction services, such as uh, needle exchange, uh, HIV testing and treatment, also social services and drug treatment services. So that was one side of the project, was to understand uh, the, the personal experiences of women who use drugs in accessing and receiving these various services. Um, the other side of the project was actually to speak with representatives of these services, so service providers. So we wanted to describe public, private, and NGO service providers programs for uh, women who use drugs, and also the providers' experiences uh, providing these services and interacting with this population. So the study took place between December 2017 and October 2018. And our team interviewed 41 service providers in two Ukrainian cities, and these cities were Poltava uh, in central Ukraine and Slavyansk in eastern Ukraine. And the team also interviewed 37 women with histories of drug use from these cities. Um, we had a detailed interview guide that uh, covered the following topics, among others, issues of daily living, what's daily life like, asking lots of questions about uh, relationships, personal histories, education, also uh, lots of questions about social support, where these women find social support asking questions about access to services, that sort of menu of services that I covered in the previous slide, and also questions about drug use and gender norms. So we wanted to find out how these women who use drugs saw themselves as, as gendered subjects, what responsibilities they felt they had in their families and their communities as women. And we also wanted to learn about their drug use uh, norms and habits. To continue with the, uh, the study design, the various kinds of service providers that were interviewed included um, this whole list here on the left. Uh, representatives from various uh, NGOs, uh, lots of these were HIV-related service organizations, 
we interviewed physicians um, who were working in government um, healthcare institutions, for example. We interviewed government employees, social workers, representatives of penitentiary services, uh, police officers, and also representatives of religious coalitions who have also played uh, a role in providing services to uh, people who use drugs and people living with HIV in the country. And then on the right, um, this is kind of the selection criteria for the uh, interviewees amongst uh, women who use drugs. They were all over 18 years of age. Um, some of them had a history of receiving services, various services from NGOs and state organizations. So they were uh, quote unquote clients of organizations. Others did not have a history of receiving services. So they were non-clients. They had various histories of drug use. Uh, some were longtime users, some had been using uh, for shorter periods, uh, some were more episodic, while, while as others um, were more chronic, uh, chronic users. Um, the women, some had children, some did not have children, uh, some were married, some weren't. They had varied socioeconomic statuses. And because, uh, of course, with the, the situation right now with uh, the war in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, our, we wanted to include in our interviewees um, locals and also women who had been evacuated um, from the uh, occupied uh, territories or the non-government controlled territories in the east of Ukraine. Okay, so um, after we transcribed and translated these interviews, we uploaded the transcripts into MaxQDA, which is a qualitative data management and analysis software program that facilitates the coding, analysis, and retrieval of qualitative data. And then as a research team, we developed a coding system um, and then coded the data set with the coding system. After the interviews were coded, for this stage of analysis and for this paper in particular, we focus specifically on the interviews with the 73 women who use drugs. So I'll just make the point that the, the paper I'm talking about today is based um, mostly on interviews with the clients, not with the service providers. And we explored these women's experiences related to employment and financial status in the context of their roles as mothers, um, their interpersonal relationships with partners, parents, and other family members, and also more formal forms of socioeconomic aid, such as government pensions, child credits, and NGO-based assistance programs. Then we summarized each the participants' responses and experiences within each of these domains and used these summaries to explore ideas about care obligations and access to services in the context of socioeconomic stability and relationships. I'll say just a few words here about the interviewee characteristics of these 73 women. Um, taken together, the average age was 35 years old. About half of them were married or living with a partner. 27% uh, were single and 13.5% described themselves as widowed or divorced. Um, half the women had one or two children almost 20% of them had three or more children and the rest uh, reported having no children. You can see that the economic status of our interviewees was, was quite low. Only 13.5% uh, described themselves as having enough resources to meet most needs. 40.5% reported that they could afford only essential needs, and 43% reported that they were living below the living wage. So overall, um, economic status was very low. Uh, also of, of note is the fact that 45% of our interviewees reported some history of homelessness and incarceration. And the health uh, status of the interviewees is also concerning. 40.5% uh, reported being HIV positive, 
and 70.3% reported having a history of hepatitis C. And this very much squares with um, recent studies that have shown uh, what a serious problem hepatitis C is amongst uh, injecting drug uh, populations uh, in the region. So moving along to talk uh, briefly about some of the theoretical concepts that we uh, draw out in this, in this research and in this paper in particular on moral economies of care. Um, the notion of moral economy dates to Aristotelian economic theory, and it has been explored widely in the social sciences. At its core, the idea of a moral economy posits that the economy is moral in that it operates within a circumscribed context of society's wider institutions and values. At its root, the moral economy is about relationships, the shared mores and values with which people evaluate their relations with others. And moral economies, and this comes out in the research as you'll see, is often structured by a dichotomizing criteria. So deserving, undeserving, worthy, unworthy, good, bad. Social scientists um, likewise have variously uh, approach the study of care, and care is another key theoretical concept in our, in our uh, study here. Social scientists have shown the myriad ways that care is involved with the social constitution of personhood. And feminist scholars of care point out the coercive aspects of care expectations as traditional gender roles assign the bulk of caring labors and duties to women. So for the purposes of our paper here, the moral economy of care refers to gender, general expectations of care and deservedness in a social group, who is expected to care for others and who is seen as deserving of care. And again, for our study, the moral economy of care is the discursive judgments about deservedness, obligation, and reciprocity that structure expectations of women who use drugs to take care of others and to receive care themselves. And our application of the notion of moral economy to thinking about care is a response to recent calls in medical anthropology to trouble discussions of care, which have had a tendency to conceal, and here I'm quoting Duclos and Criado, the importance of antagonisms, exclusions, and terrors of many sorts in the historical shaping of care, its objects, and its practices. And I'll just um, note here something that I haven't really articulated directly, but um, you know, we were very interested in learning how these women see themselves as women and what um, expectations they see uh, society having of them as women um, and for some of them as mothers. And it was very much the case that um, they adhered to traditional um, ideas about gender roles and um, of which assign uh, care duties primarily to women, especially care duties uh, in the family to take care of children and to take care of uh, partners and other family members. And uh, the women in our study very much aspired to uh, fulfill those expect traditional expected gender roles. And we'll see in a moment um, why that is a problem and why, why that uh, is very challenging for, for these women. So as we got into the analysis uh, and we did the coding and everything that I talked about uh, earlier, we identified these four primary domains of moral economy of care for women who use drugs. Um, and these domains were the following, caring for children, caring for partners, uh, the role of the state and NGOs as a caregiver for, uh, for citizens, and these women's desire to be a recipient of care themselves. And they talked about their longing uh, to receive care and support from their own families of origin, especially their parents. 
they also articulated um, a desire to be part of mutual care networks with women uh, in their situation. So in this case, with other women um, who use drugs, for example. So these were the four primary domains of moral economy of care. Um, and within, or sort of across uh, these, we, um, we identified three major dimensions of care across those four domains. And so these were really, um, you can think of these as the themes that, ca that came out in the interviews with women. Um, they were deservedness and social worth, the obligatory nature of care, and reciprocity in care relations. Um, so I'd like to take each of these in turn and consider um, some examples from our interviews. So here we're really, really getting into the, the interview data and sharing some of the women's narratives with you to illustrate these three major dimensions of care and the themes that, that came out of the conversation. So to take, to first take deservedness and social worth. And I want to reiterate um, that the women in our study positioned themselves um, very much as trying to live up to the expectations that they as women were supposed to be caregivers. Um, they positioned themselves as deserving of care, but also capable of giving care. But at the same time, um, we learned through their narratives that their deservedness and social worth as women who use drugs was constantly being questioned. Um, one theme that came out here very strongly was, and the other research has, has backed this up, is the fact that uh, women who use drugs in countries like Ukraine um, are judged more harshly than men. And so um, here's a, a quote from a provider in Poltava who said, for men, there's always the hope that maybe he will quit using, but for women, it's a sentence somehow, almost like a curse somehow. People feel sorry for sons who are users and their mothers too. But if it's a daughter, then both the daughter and the mother are judged because the mom should have raised the daughter better then everybody knows their business. But for sons, it's okay. And then we had an interviewee named Ruslana from Poltava uh, who said, people say I'm a goner, a bitch who hasn't protected her health in the proper way. It seems to me that women who use drugs are treated worse, even worse than those who drink. The men are like, why do you drink? Why do you smoke? You should have children. So again, um, some really uh, vivid, it, illustrations of how uh, gender role expectations um, really uh, cause women to be judged more harshly uh, than men when they are found to be uh, to be using drugs. I should have said before that the uh, interviews were conducted in Russian and Ukrainian, depending on the interviewee's uh, language of preference, and then they were transcribed um, to that, that language in the native uh, language, and then the interviews were translated into English. So it's the English translations that I'm, I'm using here uh, to illustrate, but the, the original interviews and transcriptions were in Ukrainian and Russian. Um, so the, the second domain of, um, moral economy of care here is the obligatory nature of care. And uh, the point to make here is that women who use drugs face the same care obligations as other women. So the same um, expectations for women to be caregivers um, sort of govern uh, ideas about these women. However, they are judged harshly by themselves and by others um, when they're unable to provide that care. And so a lot of the narratives, the women's narratives, actually focused on um, their deep desire to provide care and to be good caregivers um, and their deep shame 
and uh, sadness when they uh, found themselves unable to provide the kind of care that they wanted to, um, to their children, uh, to their partners. And so uh, I won't, uh, you can read Alona from Slavyansk, you can read her, her quote here, um, which she focused on um, the difficulties of providing care to her child and also described her boyfriend as, as a third child. So again, emphasizing the obligatory nature of care and caring. Women who use drugs expected to re receive care from the state and civil society. Um, and they were also often disappointed when they did not uh, receive what they expected to be adequate care. Now, a lot of research has been done in uh, post-socialist countries ab about um, the kind of uh, expectations that citizens have of state institutions and the state itself to provide a strong safety net, um, strong social services, and to, to basically be a, a take care of, of citizens. And, and we certainly saw that expectation come out in these interviews uh, with women who use drugs. Um, a lot of their narratives did focus on um, their dissatisfaction with the services that they uh, were entitled to or had experience of. And um, many times they, they narrated these um, sort of service providers as um, not being in place to support them, but rather uh, perhaps to uh, engage in surveillance uh, and to make their lives harder. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction that was expressed on the part of the women in terms of the expectation to receive care from the state and civil society. And finally, uh, reciprocity in care relations was something that, uh, an expectation that came out in the interviews. The women we interviewed desired reciprocal caring relationships, but they were often thwarted. And so the women who use drugs that we interviewed often talked about um, needing to receive care and support so that they themselves could in turn offer care and support and thus live up to their caring obligations. So this was kind of a paying it forward approach to obligations of care. Um, the women narrated themselves as caring for others, but not being cared for themselves. And so many of them talked about the extensive care they provided uh, for partners. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that we uh, expected some of the narratives that the women had um, about being really dependent on uh, their male partners, about living in isolation with their male partners, and how um, conflicts of all kinds um, had led to uh, very high rates of intimate partner violence amongst the women that we interviewed. Um, some of the women really longed for care and support from their own families, uh, but they believed that their families, so say their parents, uh, really only supported them to the extent that they believed that support would trickle down or somehow actually be directed um, to their children. So in other words, the women saw their parents supporting their children, the parents' grandchildren, and sort of trying to leave uh, the women themselves out of that care chain. The women um, really talked a lot about um, feeling like they lacked trusting relationships. They talked about not having close friends, not having close ones, and really described their lives as uh, full of isolation and loneliness. And for example, Vera from Paltava said, I've learned that you can only depend on yourself in this life. It seems like every time I think I can rely on somebody, it doesn't work out. And um, so we, we encountered stories like Vera's quite often, and it was very uh, poignant the extent to which these women um, felt very lonely and abandoned and isolated um, in their 
relationships. So um, to just give a few conclusions uh, based on our, our study and the interviews that we did and this analysis, uh, women who use drugs in Ukraine are stretched thin by a gendered moral economy of care that asks them as women to care for others, but denies them the care as women who use drugs, often poor, often sick, and often lonely, that they need in order to fulfill those caring obligations. And again, uh, we heard over and over the fact that women who use drugs are judged more harshly than men, um, in part due to their perceived failure to live up to care obligations. Um, and we found that women who use drugs are really caught in what we called a care conundrum. So um, they're, they're judged as undeserving. Um, they're judged harshly for their failure to perform their expected caring roles. Um, and, but they're still expected to, to extend care themselves. Um, they were excluded from reciprocal relations of care, uh, and this also often led to feelings of inadequacy and shame amongst women, which contributed to their social isolation. And um, to quote uh, a colleague, Olena Strelnik here, um, women who use drugs obligation to care for others is taken for granted, and that is, that's often uh, the case, that care is taken for granted. Um, what is not taken for granted, however, is that these women, whose de deservedness and social worth was questioned at every turn, have a right to be cared for themselves. So if we were to make some recommendations based on uh, this analysis for service providers, people who provide services for uh, women who use drugs, um, these would be some of the recommendations that, uh, that we can offer. Um, of course, the, the whole issue of, you know, the, the, the harmful gender stereotypes uh, that assign the bulk of caring obligations to women, um, that's part of the root of this problem. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that a single NGO or social service could, could do to upset these harmful gender stereotypes, but maybe just naming it and making people aware uh, would be a step in the right direction, um, not taking care for granted, right? We did find that economic precarity was at the root of many of the women's struggles to navigate the moral economy of care. And so we would recommend that um, economic empowerment programs for women uh, might be uh, one way to address this, um, this problem. Uh, so women-specific job training and job placement programs, as well as assistance in navigating entitlement programs. All of these would uh, benefit women who use drugs. Um, the women in our study also reported that conflicts about money led to stress and arguments with their partners and generated interpersonal violence. So perhaps um, some workshops or, or counseling either individually or in couples on financial literacy and money and relationships. Um, but I will say that um, the, the levels of interpersonal violence that were um, that came out of the the interviews were were very um, dire, and I think you know we know from previous research that it's it's an urgent issue that needs to be addressed in Ukraine. That the question of interpersonal violence, and um, our study with women who use drugs uh, certainly bore that out. So that is a very urgent issue for future research and uh, interventions to take up. Um, you know, the women also articulated a need for childcare services um, so that they could focus on uh, their own health so that they could go about the tasks of daily living. Uh, and I, we would also just recommend that service providers ask women what they need. I think there's often a tendency to assume uh, what women are going to need and childcare services um, you know, is, is something that often uh, comes up, and it also is 
you know, often something that women do need, but I would say not assuming uh, what, uh, what women uh, need, but really asking them what, what would help them in their, in their daily lives. Um, a lot of the women uh, articulated a desire to kind of uh, team up with other women who use drugs or other women who um, maybe are, are members of vulnerable populations and see how they can uh, mutually provide each other uh, assistance, advice, services, and so they discussed that it would be really great if there were uh, community centers, for example, where uh, that had women-only hours or opportunities for women-only fellowship to um, share stories, advice, and, and resources. And finally, uh, a recommendation would be uh, gender, gender sensitivity training uh, for service providers, including providers of medical services. Um, one thing that did come out in the interviews was the negative experiences that a lot of women had uh, when they were seeking medical uh, services and the, the, the really stigmatizing language and approach um, that, that they had faced as women with specific um, health issues related to drug use and HIV. So um, that's the final slide, and that's uh, really the, the, the end of the, the presentation. So I will stop sharing here and look forward to maybe discussion, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yes, uh, we can open our um, Q&A uh, session. As uh, I mentioned earlier, you can leave your question either in the uh, um, Q&A box or uh, in the chat box. If you would like to join Sarah for some comments or for some further discussions, please let us know. You can let uh, Ani know and she will open that option for you. And I, I would, if I can, <laughs> I would also say again, a huge welcome to the other uh, members of the research team that are, that are on the call. And I would, I would welcome input from, from any and all of you if there are other points you'd like to make or uh, you know, jump into the, to the conversation, fill in anything that you think I left out or clarify anything you think needs clarifying. And thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I see some, uh, Jill is joining us. Yeah, hey, uh, yeah, this is Jill. Um, sorry if there's any background noise, I'm on a bike, but um, <laughs> so Sarah, thank you so much for the, giving this presentation. It was really great to hear. Um, so one question I have for you, and I think that we've talked about this with our project team a lot is, you know, like this, this separation between the state-run services and NGOs, and I know that a lot of NGOs in the past have tried to develop women-only programs, and then they get the funding ends, so they stop. And they're thinking about ways to integrate more gender-responsive approaches into state-run services as well. Mm. So I don't know if it's a question or a comment, you know, but I think it's like a common theme we see in a lot of our work in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Jill. So for everybody, uh, that's Jill Acharzak, who is actually the PI on this project. So it's so great that you're here, Jill. Yes, I mean, what we saw, right, was that a, a couple of the organizations, and, and our team's been working together for a long time, what, like eight years now, Jill? <laughs> we had a, a previous five-year project um, that was uh, that looked at HIV service organizations in eight cities in Ukraine. And that's one thing that we found was that a lot of the gender kind of gender sensitive programming or the gender responsive programs that these HIV service organizations had, um, many of them were donor driven. Right, and so there was kind of like this this uptick in uh, services for women that were taking into account women's unique needs, uh, and so there would be uh, you know a workshop 
for women where they could work together, um, make handicrafts and sell them as a, as a form of economic empowerment. Um, there were maybe uh, child care, you know, centers where, for, for drop off where women um, who were seeking services could bring their children. But I think what we found in our study, right, Jill, was that these, because these were donor driven, as soon as that, you know, six months or year or two year period of the funding uh, was over, oftentimes there wasn't uh, sustainability and there wasn't capacity after that to keep these programs going, even if they had been successful programs. So I think your question is a good one. How do we, how do we convince <laughs> people of the importance, right, of, of gender responsive programs in a way that's going to be sustainable um, and, and not something that's seen as an kind of an outside priority that's being um, imposed on, on this landscape where, where there are lots of other uh, local priorities. I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, it's yeah, and it, yeah, and it sort of goes with the whole idea of care. Like, how do you get the state and other institutions to care about these women? Yeah. Yeah, right. And how <laughs> I mean that's 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 really the key question, right? Is how how do you emphasize that these are human beings that have worth, personal worth, social worth, um, that are full-fledged citizens, right? Deserving of respect deserving of care, deserving of, of services. Um, and I, I think that's something that our, our colleague Jennifer Carroll talks about uh, in her wonderful book. If people haven't, uh, haven't seen Jennifer Carroll's book, Narcomania, I highly uh, recommend it, Drugs, HIV, and Citizenship in Ukraine. That's one thing that Jen writes about, right, is how um, people who use drugs and people living with HIV, m mostly the former category, have, have kind of become the ultimate other um, in Ukraine. And so, yes, how do we humanize a population that has been so, um, so dehumanized? It's a big question. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Uh, one of them is from Irina Voloshina. Were there any recent similar initiatives designed to help veteran women? Ah, oh, interesting question, Irina. Um, hmm. So I guess I'm when you say similar initiatives, I'm wondering if that's referring to service organizations, organizations that provide specific services to veteran women. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, Irina. It's a really good one. Um, and I, I want to find out more. So I'm definitely going to be following up on that. If you know of any uh, programs, um, I'd love to hear hear from you. Um, I'm also wondering about um, maybe veterans who um, were injured uh, in uh, the conflict, maybe have disabilities, um, maybe emotional issues like PTSD. I wonder if there are gender sensitive services for such women veterans. Um, and I, I'd love to learn more. So I'm going to be looking into that. And if you, Irina, if you know of, of any, please send them my way. Mm -hmm. And uh, Irina just specified her question for veteran women who use or used drugs. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, again, great question. I don't know. I don't know. It's something, it's something to look at. Um, you know, while our study was um, partially situated in uh, Slavyansk, uh, we didn't uh, really uh, hit on questions of women veterans who use drugs. And as far as I know, none of the interviewees in the study uh, were, were veterans, but that is certainly a, a population that, um, that we should know more about. So thank you for bringing that um, to our attention. Mm -hmm. 
So another uh, question and a comment uh, is from uh, Alyssa Farmer, and I will read the whole text. Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. I am a PhD student at the University of Kentucky, and my dissertation research is focusing on the realities between global uh, health founders and local HIV NGOs. Do you notice that the funders, NGOs, and service providers also have these assumptions about deservingness and morality for women who use drugs? Are these assumptions coming from individuals, the state, or global health? <laughs> Well, wow, that's a great uh, question, Alyssa, and your, uh, your dissertation sounds great. I'd love to, to hear more about that, and best of luck with your, um, your dissertation work. That's a really complicated question, and I have to say that, um, and, and others from our team can, can jump in if you like, we were really focusing more on, again, as I mentioned, the perspectives of the clients themselves or the women who use drugs themselves and how they believed they were being perceived. Um, I have to say my impression from the interviews with the providers is that um, the providers were very, um, well, depending on which kinds of institutions they came from, but certainly the providers who worked in the nonprofit sector um, were very sympathetic uh, to the women, um, were uh, really, um, you know, well-trained professionals, uh, you know, steeped in ideals of, of harm reduction, um, and who were very uh, dedicated to, uh, to providing um, support and services to uh, the women. I can't speak to um, the, the donors. So for example, you know, a lot of these organizations got their funding from the Global Fund uh, to fight uh, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Um, I can't really talk about the motivations of those um, those donors um, and sort of the 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 the, the conduits through which um, the money uh, was coming. That that wasn't really the focus of this project. But I think it's a really good question to be asking about um, where are these perceptions coming from. And and I do think that Jen Carroll, um, you know, looks at that question very critically in her book. Um, I don't know if others in the in the project, maybe specifically Jill or Alona, uh, would want to speak to that uh, question at all. But I I like the direction you're going, Alyssa, in in looking critically at um, at how those perceptions are are formed and at what levels they're they're formed. Our next question is from Emily Chanel Justice. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, two questions. First, it doesn't seem like all that much has changed in terms of aid and how aid is decided, distributed from your two earlier book projects. Would you agree or not? Why do you think that is? And the second question, I'm wondering if you did any research or asked questions about women's interactions with police and policing institutions. I know that there has been some police reform that attempts to deal more sensitively with violence against women, but I don't know that these have been effective and maybe this is something you've explored. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much. Great to see you on the call. Um, the first question about, uh, gosh, I've sort of forgotten it. How, how aid is distributed? Is that how aid? Yes, it was um, uh, it, how aid is decided, distributed from your two earlier book projects. Uh huh. Right. So yes, um, in in my work, I've been I've I've been critical of how international aid. Um, is often uh, offered and distributed in places um, like Ukraine, um, and, and specifically the whole problem of donor-driven initiatives, right? The fact that um, international donors come in with their own um, priorities and their own uh, projects, and then local organizations have to scramble 
to uh, sort of uh, mold their um, their missions and, and mold their grant proposals to fit the donor uh, priorities. Yes, <laughs> I mean we continue we continue to see the same uh, the same issues um, happening in Ukraine when we're talking about HIV prevention um, and uh, you know issues uh, trying to um, support people who use drugs and, and harm production harm reduction programs. One bright spot, I would say, that was borne out in our research is that um, some of these uh, local initiatives, and there really are grassroots um, organizations, NGOs, that have a long history in Ukraine that were often founded by people who in some way, shape, or form had themselves been touched by uh, issues of drug use, um, HIV, a lot, maybe not a lot, but some of these organizations and these um, professionals really have done a really good job of forming excellent relationships with city and regional governments such that they have been able to get their priorities recognized and supported by um, these you know, local and regional governments so that they are less dependent on um, the international aid than maybe um, other, other groups. So I would say that's a, a, a promising uh, trend uh, that we've seen. Um, we know that the global fund is slowly um, reducing um, the support to Ukraine and expecting uh, the Ukrainian government to take up a much larger share of um, the initiatives um, to fight HIV. And I guess we'll just see, we'll just see how those, um, how those go. But that, that process has already um, been well underway um, of that kind of uh, transition. Um, as for your second question, Emily, I love the question. I don't know the answer. Um, we did uh, that um, topic of um, policing and um, you know the experiences of people who use drugs encountering uh, police is in is in our uh, research. We do have interviews around that topic. Um, it's not something that I have focused on for the in analysis yet and so hopefully i guess my answer to your question is stay tuned <laughs> as we continue working up the data um that very well may be one of the issues that we drill um drill down into more so thank you for uh for the question and i'll keep it in mind uh, <clears throat> aluna majnaya says thank you for your uh talk and uh, for efforts to share the work that you conducted together collectively and she also um has a question do you think people who use drugs are, are othered differently in ukraine compared to the u.s what are the sim similarities and differences oh aluna what a great question. Um, I think you know a lot more about uh, <laughs> the situation than, than I do, um, Alona. So I actually would, would love to know your, uh, your thoughts um, on this. Do you have the capability to turn on your mic, Alona, and talk to us? Hi, Sarah. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that my question will bounce back to me. <laughs> I wouldn't have asked such a hard question. In that yeah, case. now you see, now you see. But what, no, what see. do you think? What do you think? Um, I think there are a lot of similarities, but I don't know, maybe the community of people, and I talk in a broad sense, community, community from NGOs, community of people who do research in this topic, I think is much stronger in the US, maybe because it has more time to develop or has access to more resources, even though they are still limited. But compared to Ukraine, I don't know. I feel like there are more advocacy that is done and the scale of that advocacy is bigger in the US compared to the Ukraine. But 
qualitatively, I don't know. I feel like it's something very interesting to explore. Yeah, I, I think it's a great it's a great question. And I I I remember when we were in gosh, I guess it was Dnipro Petrovsk, Dnipro now. Um, and we were at the organization that had a, a pretty strong advocacy organs organization for I can't remember what it was called, Alona, but it was something like the network of people who use drugs, <laughs> literally. And so I, I remember feeling like, wow, that seems such a, a strong statement that they're making because it, you know, it's not network of people living with HIV. It's not, um, you know, network of people. I don't know what another example was, but it was, they were taking on that identity of people who use drugs and using that as the basis of their advocacy organization. And in the Ukrainian context, that seems so revolutionary um, to me. I, I'm not sure if I saw that in another country or you know, in the US, if I would really think twice about it. So I think just my own visceral reaction sort of backs up what you're saying. Um, but yeah, it's something, yeah, it's an interesting question. Thanks for posing it, Aliona, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, if um, we don't have any other questions, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah, for your uh, presentation and uh, for your great talk. And thank you for participating in our series of uh, saw talks and lectures. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Natalia, for the invitation. Thank you, Ani, uh, for everything. And uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, who came to to hear the talk? I'm really really gratified, and it was it was great uh, talking about the project. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you um, everyone for attending and for uh, posting. Today we started our Ukraso talks and lectures with Sarah Phillips' lecture, "Moral Economies of Care and Women Who Use Drugs in Ukraine." Thank you for attending our lecture today, and please join us next Tuesday. Information about upcoming events will be posted on the Ukraso listserv and on our Facebook page, Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. Thank you.